this previous struggles and um, some new friendships along the way really help him um, change his direction to toward what he who he really wants to be. I think that this text is one of the most motivating summer reads that I've seen in the past 22 years at RBC. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. I think students will really enjoy it. Um, it does have a first person narration. The voice is really authentic. Um, it's like you're right there with um, Castle as he goes through his problems, the language and um, the, the way that he characterizes, um, ca the author characterizes Castle really puts you right in the scene. Um, also, one of the greatest um, lessons in this text is that it doesn't matter where you come from or what you've experienced, but how you really take those lessons you learn and use those as you move forward. The last page of the novel is a huge cliffhanger, which I mentioned earlier, it's part of a four book series. And each of the next three books is about one of the new teammates um, that he forms a friendship with on his track team. So the ending is really the start of something else. So it, it's very motivating to draw readers in and make them curious about the next books in the series. And then it's a very well organized, easy to follow. I think it would going to be very motivating and students will be able to read independently and really come prepared um, in the fall to, to take part in what we have planned for this novel. Various themes that are important, especially as students are transitioning from Dodge to RBC in middle school is forming relationships and friendships, forming an identity, um, utilizing perseverance, not letting one's past define him or her, um, taking responsibility, overcoming obstacles. And the biggest one that we were looking forward to talking about is setting goals um, within our curriculum. Any questions about that title? Amy, you okay. make me read that book. What'd you, I'm sorry? You make me want to read the book. You just I, you. About it. You really do want to read it. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I haven't been ex this excited about a summer read in a long time. I, I really, I can't wait. Nice. And there's three more books. That's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let me pull up the presentation and we'll get started with uh, the eighth grade title. We've been really excited, I'll just start while Jen's pulling that up. We've been really excited to explore getting some different books in our summer reading. Um, we've been reading Curveball for a very long time and it definitely has its merits um, and it's a good book, but there's a lot of new literature out there. And I think that's kind of what Amy found and seventh grade team found as well. There's just a lot more that's coming out that's just so wonderful. So uh, in eighth grade, we, the honors group is still going to read The Outsiders as a required reading, but then all eighth graders will read a second book of their choosing. So we're really trying to facilitate more choice in eighth grade. Uh, we try to focus on independent reading throughout the year, so this is a nice way to start them off. And so I have two books that I'm going to ask the committee to approve for eighth grade summer reading, um, but we will do, when we come back in the fall, with after students have read the book, we'll kind of facilitate some book club style discussions, knowing full well that some students will have read one title and others will have read the other. So it'd be hard to do a whole class discussion, but some book club style discussions, just like many adults like to have. <laughs> um, the first title is New Kid by Jerry Craft and came out in 2019. So it's super fresh and it's a graphic novel. And we've never had a graphic novel on our required reading list before, and it is excellent. Uh, we flew through it. All of us did. All four of us have read it and just powered right through it. It's just wonderful. Um, and I actually passed my copy off to one of my students who just is devouring it right now, too. So it's really high interest um, about a kid named Jordan who leaves his neighborhood public school. You can read that here to go to a more affluent private school. Um, and there's a couple... Um, references to like not having to have gone through these 
difficult challenges growing up, um, but people kind of assuming that because he's a minority, he's gone through a very difficult life. And he's actually, um, a, a lot of the kids in his school have very dysfunctional families and parents who are absent from life. And he has the most stable family of all of his friends that he's met at his new school. Um, you know, he and his parents, they sit down to eat at dinner and mom's in school and dad has a job, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, so he ha explores a lot of those challenges and successes of being a minority in the mostly white school. Talks a lot about like, those little microaggressions that I think are all on our radar. And Jordan is dealing, Jordan and his friends are dealing with those with their classmates and their teachers and that sort of thing. Um, we like we just really feel like it's an incredibly high interest book, and uh, I'm getting really good feedback from my students who have read it. I've actually had several kids choose it for their independent readings this quarter. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions about New Kid before I go on to the next text? I don't have a question, but I think it's really a good book in terms of what we have heard from incoming ninth graders who are coming in from a different school. Oh, okay. they, really, they really feel like they are a different group of people and they feel like they don't, they aren't, they haven't grown up in Twinsburg all their life and they feel really kind of different. And that's been, um, Annie, I think in Ice and You, um, I think Ice and You came in actually not as a, a Twinsburger all the way through. So I think that um, this is going to be a really good book for those kids even if they are from Twinsburg, to read about how other people might feel and learn a little empathy, so. Right, no, I think that's a great point, for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then is it Maya, I'm sorry, you said your sons loved it? That's wonderful, that's awesome. Okay, um, if no one else has any other questions, I'll go on to the next text. Um, so Saving Red is actually a novel in verse, and I feel like we are just like, changing it all up here. We are throwing out a graphic novel and a novel in verse, um, but we also really loved this book. And so we were really excited to offer this as an option for students. A lot of our students are starting to read novels in verse uh, as just their independent reading. It's really attractive to some of our reluctant readers who don't want to, who get overwhelmed by just pages and pages of text. So novel and verse is a little bit more appealing to them. Uh, but the story of Molly, uh, who's the narrator, it's in first person, and she meets a homeless teenager in the first couple of pages named nicknamed Red. Uh, and she's really working through a lot of her own emotions about her own family. Um, and she's trying to reunite Red with her family in time for Christmas. Uh, there's a lot of uh, themes of family and friendship and forgiveness. Um, Molly's going through some personal guilt that she has in her family. Um, uh, you know, her brother had gone missing and she has a lot of guilt about that. And so she's dealing with all of those emotions while at the same time trying to have this, and she has this purpose of getting Red back to her family. Uh, we. Again, another one we just like poured through it. It was so good. Like I finished it and like, you know, how Dodge just set up. I like leaned over to Kristen Walters, like, I love this book. Thank you so much. It was incredible. It was very good. Um, and I've, I've seen a couple of kids talk about it in book talks to me for their independent reading projects over the last couple of years. So I know that it's interesting to them as well. Um, Anybody, question please? for the high school. Um, and maybe Jen, didn't we just recommend a, a high school a novel written in verse? Something that Megan presented before? Was it Elevator or something? Yeah, I was think it, so. Was it a Jason Reynolds book? I think so. And the reason I bring it up, I think it's it's nice that there's, there's a, a runway to that by having a similar kind of book at the middle school. So. Oh, good. Great. Thanks. Long road down. Ooh. Yeah. Mm. It's about the elevator. Yes. Took yeah, me a while. That's a popular one. A lot yeah. of our students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Jason Reynolds himself is a very popular yeah. author right now. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions for either of those new titles? I know this is super hard to read. Um, mm -hmm. I will. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention, first say thank you. I'm very excited about some new titles for uh, RBC. Um, also, um, choice, I'm hoping that you'll hear more and more about student voice and choice as we continue making 
suggestions to the committee as we uh, had our 21st century curriculum, uh, uh, 21st century teaching and learning committee through the strategic plan. There was a lot of focus on that we wanted our students to have more voice and choice. So hopefully that will be something that continues. Um, on the screen now you will see the summer reading um, K to six has not changed at all. Um, listening to an adult read um, or minutes are on the website. Um, and then so for seventh grade, we have ghosts. And then for um, the honors, we'll have I always write you back, um, new kid or saving red. And as uh, Gabby said, I'm very excited about having a graphic novel for the first time. Um, I think our students are going to um, not only the content of New Kid, but also just the format of graph a graphic novel. Um, and then um, for the high school, all of those titles have been approved previously. Um, sometimes they swap in and out. I believe we approved Wild in the um, fall. And these, as long as it's been approved before, sometimes the teachers determine that that title may be a better title to have, um, a better title to have in some, during the school year. So. Um, but otherwise, these are the same. Um, go ahead, Gabby. Sorry, I tried to read it without getting my face all up in the camera. Um, it's, so just to double check, you do still have the outsiders for honors, right? In we addition do. to the choice. Yeah. Okay. I'm Thank sorry. You. Thank you. No, that's okay. I just I'm trying not to give you a poor <laughs> Go ahead, Mrs. Powers. So, um, Jen, no, just a question, a clarifying question. Last year, given the pandemic, we didn't have the summer reading requirements for students. Uh, remember we did the bingo sheet or, or something like that. So is it the intention this year to go back to summer reading requirements? Have we discussed that with the, the teaching staff? What What is their feeling about that? Um, we uh, provided this to the building principals back in February and that seemed to be the way we wanted to go. Um, there is no Nothing that says we could not still do the bingo board and have that as part of these minutes. Um, I thought that was well received last year. It's fun, it's something different. And I know the public library is going to do that as well. So maybe we could work in conjunction with them and turn um, the minutes into the bingo board as well. Okay. All right. What I would like to do now is take the adoption of the summer reading for 2020 um, to the committee for vote. Um, so again, we won't use the chat feature as last time. So Kristen is going to call roll. Um, each time she calls roll, it'll go in the same order. So we'll do this one, two, three, four. We have five times to do this. So um, Kristen, we'll let you um, get started. And this is for approval of the summer reading. Okay, and I tried to catch everybody as they were coming in. So if at the end, if I did not call you, please let me know. Um, and I'll make sure to mark you off as here. Um, and please correct me if I say your name wrong. Um, so I'm just gonna go in order here. Beth Osick? I'm here. Okay, uh, and this is just for approvals. Um, Jennifer Farthing? Yes. Norm Potter? Yes. Tawana Honeycutt? Yes. Kathy Powers? Yes. Adrian Gordon? Yes. Andrea Walker? Yes. Maya Brown Zimmerman? Yes. Benita Galozzi? Yes. Jim Reese? Yes. Sorry if you can hear my dogs. <laughs> Alexa Sabo? Yes. Laura Hebert? Yes. Donna Houston? Yes. Malcolm Sung? Yes. Karen Turner? Yes. Cynthia Booker? Yes. Lindsay Glavin? Yes. Eleanor Linick? Yes. Jamie Routman? Yes, it's Zach Routman. Oh, hi, Zach. Sorry about that. Uh, Lynn nice. Villa? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, Annie Glover? Yes. I sing Callahan. Yes. Okay, terrific. Did I miss anybody? Okay, great. Thanks. 
Thank you, everyone. We will take that to the Board of Education at the April 21st meeting. Okay, um, next up we have committee member and high school uh, business chair, Donna Houston. Um, she is pinch hitting for Mrs. Swinning tonight for these two courses. And the first one is microeconomics. And Donna, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. So we have um, for the microeconomics course, AP microeconomics, we would like to um, update our textbook. And it is the Krugman's Economics for the AP course, third edition. And you can see what it looks like there on the front cover. It's following the planning structure and the standards from the College Board. Um, the textbook has short modules that help the students to tackle the concepts uh, in more manageable chunks. Each top topic will offer both AP style multiple choice as well as the mini FRQs um, questions and each one then relates to the topic. Uh, it also includes a full practice AP microeconomics exam in it. Here is um, one of the pages that shows the AP style question that is tied to a module in that textbook for practice. And then there are additional online resources that the students could use. One is um, the online flashcards for them. Any questions for Mrs. Houston? We have not, uh, this is the, um, we have not updated this textbook since we approved this course. So yeah. we've had good success with AP Micro, um, but this is our first um, re-adoption of a textbook for this course. Okay. okay, I don't hear any questions. Um, I will uh, turn it over to Kristen for vote um, on this textbook, please. Okay, Beth Posick. Yes. Jennifer Farthing. Yes. Norm Potter. Yes. Tawana Honeycutt. Yes. Kathy Powers. Yes. Adrian Gordon. Yes. Andrea Walker. Yes. Maya Brown Zimmerman. Yes. Benita Glozy. Yes. Jim Reese. Yes. Alex Sable. Yes. Laura Hebert. Yes. Donna Houston. Yes. <laughs> Malcolm Zung. Yes. Uh, Karen Turner. Yes. Cynthia Booker. Yes. Lindsay Glavin. Yes. Eleanor Linick. Yes. Zach Routman. Yes. Lynn Villa. Yes. Tony Glover. Yes. I think he'll him. Yes. Terrific. Thank you. Okay. And now staying with the business department, uh, we are going to talk about uh, dual credit financial accounting, which is a course that we offer in partnership with Hiram College. Okay, Mrs. Houston. Yes, and this one is, we are updating this book as well. It is called Financial and Many, Man, now I'm not going to be able to say the word properly. Um, man, manor, oh my goodness. Man, managerial. <laughs> managerial. Managerial accounting. I'm sorry. Um, and information for decisions, and it's the ninth edition textbook for this one. And with this one, it is like um, Mrs. Farthing said, it is uh, the newest edition with Hiram College. And let's see, um, it has Excel simulations in it. So that provides that hands-on project-based learning for the students. And the publisher all, also offers many videos and tutorials for them as well to supplement their learning at home if something is more difficult for them, um, that way they could practice with that. Uh, there is one more slide, I believe, and this one just shows that some of the Excel simulations where they're creating and applying that learned material. 
Thank you. Uh, this is one we don't necessarily have a lot of uh, choice mm -hmm. with um, when Hiram, it's part of working with the dual credit programming with College Credit Plus with Hiram. When they adopt a new textbook, it's the expectation that the district follows suit. Um, and we, I don't, I believe our last edition was the seventh edition. We did not get the eighth edition. Um, there weren't a lot of changes. And then now the ninth edition is out and you'll see that the copyright date is not until 2022. Um, does anyone have any questions for Mrs. Houston or I about this textbook? Okay, Mrs. Cash, take it away. Okay, Beth Osig? Yes. Jen Farthing? Yes. Norm Potter? Yes. Tawana Honeycutt? Yes. Kathy Powers? Adrian Gordon. Yes. Andrea Walker. Yes. Maya Brown Zimmerman. Yes. Bonita Galozzi. Yes. Jim Reese. Yes. Alex Sabo. Yes. Laura Hebert. Yes. Donna Houston. Yes. Malcolm Sung. Yes. Karen Turner. Yes. Cynthia Booker. Yes. Lindsay Glavin. Yes. Eleanor Linick. Yes. Zach Routman. Yes. Lynn Villa. Yes. Annie Glover. Yes. Ison Calhan. Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you everyone from the business department. And thank you Mrs. Houston for presenting this evening. Uh, now, uh, you'll notice there's been a theme here throughout this meeting and last meeting in regard to textbooks at the high school level. So um, this evening we are going to present two uh, science textbooks to you and we have Mrs. Thomas with us this evening and we are going to start with environmental science. And again, this textbook, it's been a really long time on this one since we have approved a new textbook. Okay, Shannon, sorry for stealing your thunder. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. Um, can you stop sharing and I'll share my slideshow? Alrighty, so um, first one here coming up is um, the environmental science, your world, your turn. Um, we are extremely excited um, that this elective has grown in the past couple years and looking at our enrollment, it's a very popular third science um, credit for many of our students. And so we were really trying to find a textbook that carried through with a theme um, of keeping a lot of our studies to some local environmental issues, um, both here within Twinsburg and in Ohio, um, and looking for um, groupings of real data sets, um, knowing that many of these students are juniors, um, getting ready to take the ACT, and we know on the ACT science section, being able to read and interpret graphs are extremely important. Um, so those were really two big features that we found in this particular text um, that we think will be engaging to students. Um, one of the things we found as teachers um, in looking at um, getting students to uh, write using the theme of claim evidence reasoning is one of the features this okay, text sorry. has um, is what's called defend your case. And so it presents students a case study and asks them to gather evidence based on that unit's objectives and then support their reasoning um, using scientific literacy. So we really liked those three features, just looking at the layout of the text and what it included. 
obviously with the pandemic, pandemic, it has put digital resources kind of in our forefront. Um, when we look at the modules that um, teachers can assign online, it's an extremely flexible program. You can edit, um, order how things are presented on the screen. So we really like that feature. And we also liked that it is very connected to Google Earth, um, which plays into a lot of our Google tools and our Chromebooks that the students are using. And so while it may present a global case study, um, it does give ideas to take that local. So the example they showed you here um, is in the Gulf of Mexico, um, but you can also go and take that same temperature data and put it into Lake Erie. So it was very interesting. Um, for us in getting even some more ideas for our course. It's an online dashboard that students view. Again, it's very um, organizational driven for them also um, so that they can see content assignments. Um, it links through Google Classroom. And then kind of the last feature to point out is that it provides an audio version of all of the reading sections. Um, so students can hear um, the the text read aloud to them. All right, that is my environmental science. I'll stop sharing here for a moment, see if there's any questions I can address for you. All right, Jen, do you want me to go on to the next one or are these two separate votes? They're two separate votes. So okay. as long as we have the patience of your children, we'll do both. We'll do them separately. Oh, no. um, <laughs> we'll well, they, weren't, they weren't too loud. The, no, next, the next episode just came on, so we should be good. Okay. <laughs> um, and as Shannon said, the course environmental science has grown a lot, and we're excited about that. And we feel it's time for new resources for our students. And I think this looks very interesting to them and I think they will enjoy it. So um, I will stop talking and let Mrs. Cash call the roll. Okay, Beth Osick. Yes. Jim Farley. Yes. Norm Potter. Yes. Tawana Honeycutt. Yes. Kathy Powers. Yes. Adrian Gordon. Yes. Andrea Walker. Yes. Maya Brown Zimmerman. Yes. Bonita Galozzi. Yes. Jim Reese. Yes. Alex Sabo. Yes. Laura Hebert. Yes. Donna Houston. Yes. Malcolm Sung. Yes. Karen Turner. Yes. Cynthia Booker. Yes. Lindsay Glavin. Yes. Eleanor Linick. Yes. Zach Routman. Yes. Lynn Villa. Yes. Annie Glover. Yes. Jason Callahan. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll move on to physical science then. All right, so the physical science book, this is typically a course our 10th graders take after they've taken biology. Um, the goal of the course is that it's an introduction to both um, physical science perspectives in chemistry and physics. Um, we really liked the framework of this text. Um, it's a different publisher than what um, we have currently for most of the department with McGraw-Hill, um, but we loved the aspect that it builds off of project-based learning. And several of the physical science teachers have done some summer professional development in the previous years. And then the pandemic hit and we really embraced some of these concepts as alternatives to some of the other paper pencil assessments that we've been given in the past. So I think it's really something that the teachers are interested in incorporating more. And several others are looking to one of Jennifer's summer development um, opportunities in PBLs, I think, also this summer. Um, so they like um, that the Inspire series builds upon this idea of wonder or curiosity um, and asking questions and bringing some real world perspectives to it also. Um, this 
textbook also has a lot of online resources and one uh, resource that the teacher has brought up and mentioned um, several times in their conversations is this online bulletin board it has little removable sticky notes and so it helps bring that curiosity um, to do the forefront of the lessons so students can work together um, in brainstorming questions and they can track their progress as they move throughout the unit. Um, this text also brings in claim evidence reasoning summaries um, as a way to um, unify the end result um, in getting students to be able to think scientifically and write scientifically. The digital resources um, are linked with FET simulations, and this is a pretty popular tool, um, both in our chemistry and our physics classes. And so the teachers were excited to see this being introduced um, one year earlier, um, having students get a little more work with the FET simulations. Um, it also has a very interactive dashboard, again, um, that has students work with things like infographics or being able to take a concept and have different layers of that concept revealed as a study tool. It has drag and drop simulations built into it, and then what they call click and change, um, what's with, with, that works with graphing and understanding uh, graphical reasoning. So again, there is a notebook, um, is what they call their online platform, um, that teachers can customize, students can organize it, um, it collects assignments that way, and all of the reading sections provide audio versions also. Uh, we just feel that's a very important feature to have in um, our online resources. All right, I will stop sharing here to see if you have any questions. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment that the one function where they can track their own progress um, really aligns pretty well with our strategic plan and the idea that kids own their own their learning and can track it as they go and you know see see what they need to work on. So I think that function of the book is really important. Yeah, we definitely wanted to make sure that we could see the students' versions of all of this to see what they can see. And so we looked for things to be extremely laid out, spelled out, connected with Google Classroom. All of those things were important for us. And I think the pandemic has really heightened us being able to um, communicate through this digital world, um, those sorts of ideas. Um, and this program also is um, in aligned with seventh and eighth grade. They use Inspire Science at seventh and eighth grade. Um, so it will be, in, it'll skip a year with biology, but then it'll pick right back up. And the textbook is slightly different. It's a consumable at seventh and eighth grade, but um, right. <laughs> it's still the same program. And I like what Dr. Hebert said about the students tracking their progress. And um, I, for those of you non-educators, we are going to have a new evaluation system next year. We are in OTES 1 this year, or OTES, and then now it's going to be OTES 2.0. And there is a focus in that on student voice and choice, and then the students tracking their own progress and being responsible for their learning. So I think these tools are all going hand in hand with those changes. Um, does anyone have any questions for Mrs. Thomas? Okay, Mrs. Cash, last roll call for the night for this. Okay, Beth Osick? Yes. Jen Farthing? Yes. Norm Potter? Yep. Tawana Honeycutt? Yes. Kathy Powers? Mrs. Powers, are you still on? She's on. I'd okay. say go ahead and go on. Okay. Adrian Gordon. Yes. Andrea Walker. Yes. Maya Brown Zimmerman. Yes. Vanita Glozzi. Yes. Jim Reese. Yes. Alex Sabo. Yes. Laura Hebert. Yes. Donna Houston. Yes. Malcolm Sung. Yes. Karen Turner. Yes. Cynthia Booker. 
Yes. Lindsay Gravin. Yes. Eleanor Linick. Yes. Jack Routman. Yes. Lynn Villa. Yes. Annie Glover. Yes. Ison Calhoun. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. All right, thank you students. It was nice seeing your faces. Thank you parents um, for being a part of our discussion tonight. Okay, thank you very much for your participation with that. Um, next, we are going to uh, have a federal grants um, public hearing. Um, Norm, I'm gonna pull it up and let you can start talking while I get pulling that up. Uh, I get the most exciting topic of the night with title one, two, three, and four. So I'm gonna make this as enjoyable as possible. This is a federal mandate that we have to present how we spend our funds in a public forum every year. And we'll be presenting that here tonight. Uh, obviously we'll take any questions you may have about how uh, these reports are laid out, but we will start with title one, which is targeted assistance specifically in reading and math for grades K through eight here in Twinsburg. We are considered a targeted assisted, assistance district rather than a school-wide. School-wide is usually reserved for the ones that are more um, impoverished districts, and I've worked with a few of those, and it, the requirements are, are a little bit different when you get into that kind of programming. Um, the funding is strictly used for a support in reading and mathematics in grades one through eight, and we do have uh, Tina Magyar, who supports this and has provided a stipend through uh, Title I, small stipend. If you look through, and it's uh, it's hard to see, but if you look through the, the amount of allocations we get every year from 2009 until now, you can see that the overall total has gone up. And it could be because the per pupil allocation has gone up, or it could be because the number of students um, Usually there's a slight increase in the funding, but uh, again, it's um, it's every year you never know exactly what you're gonna get. And that sometimes will even change mid-year, which is always a fun thing to do after you set the budget and then they either take away or give you more money that you have to then balance and get approved again. So it's, it's an ongoing um, process from the time they give the funds until the actual funds are spent. So title one again is math and reading assistance. Um, I will just move on and we can answer any questions at the end. Title two is more for teacher development and professional development. This is one that we were uh, about three years ago, I believe it was about three years ago, we were told it was pretty much gonna go away and it uh, hasn't, thank goodness, because our professional development really is tied to our success of our students. And you can see that over time, uh, again, the funding has fluctuated on this one up and down a little bit. Uh, like I said, about three years ago, we thought we were going to lose all of this money. So it's very good to see that we are still able to provide professional development in the areas that you see listed, which would be mentor training, differentiation approaches, um, student evaluation, data analysis. It's, it's quite a range of what we do. Um, but obviously the science of reading and some of the other ones that we are now getting into really have supported our cause when we have gone virtually, especially the blended learning models and uh, the differentiation approaches. So those are critical funds that sometimes um, uh, people just don't know about. And like I said, when we were threatened that those were gonna go away, it was a, a, a very interesting time to think about how we're gonna provide uh, teacher professional development if this was taken away. Title three is our for our EL department. It, it's basically working with students, and EL stands for English Language Learners. Um, it used to be ELL, and it was something before that. They changed that often also. But this is strictly to help our students that are learning uh, English, and they are limited in English proficiency. We do have a person that's in charge of that. Her, her name is Barbara Zales, and she has a stipend through this, uh, this part of the grant. And this one, again, is strictly for our English learners. And you can see th the money for this one actually has been decreasing over time. And that doesn't, in, in this one, it is not because our students are, uh, we have a lesser population. We actually have quite a few students in our, in our district that are English learners. 
Um, and the process is that they are tested every year to see where they're standing and they can test out of a program. And that's obviously our goal. But to date, and not all of these are English learners, but to date, there are 28 different languages spoken in Twinsburg schools and in family households. So when you start looking at the importance of this type of program, and we're getting new people all the time, it's really important to make sure that we are managing this fund uh, very carefully. The last one that I get to report on that's really exciting to everybody is Title IV. Um, this is the most flexible of the federal grants. This allows us to, to create um, programming and use effective technology and create safe and healthy uh, programs for students. And basically it gives us an opportunity to be well-rounded throughout the curriculum. Uh, some of the things that we've spent money on so far are STEM-related instructional materials, highly qualified staff development for teachers, our PBLs that were mentioned earlier, uh, working in STEM, the cadre itself, technology professional development and online subscriptions. And this is nice. The first year we got it, we got $10,000, which I think everybody got $10,000. didn't matter the size of the district. And now it actually has gone up. So there is some flexibility on what can be used there um, or how it can be used, which usually most of these federal grants are very restrictive in how you can spend money. This one gives us a little bit more leeway to open that up for other programming. That's all I have for my four. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions and Jen will be happy, I'm sure, <laughs> to chime in on these. Norm, I have a quick question. Yeah. How, do, how does it get decided if um, some of the title money goes to math versus just all reading? It, it's it's there's some testing that goes on that how the students qualify we have to make sure we're supporting the students in their needs so it's basically based on student need i don't know if that helps but that it, it changes obviously year to year based on what we're looking at in our populations what what testing are we looking at for that Jen, correct me if I'm wrong, but we look at MAP and some of the other um, diagnostics. So we, we use MAP, we have the Dibbles, we have our state testing, we all look at all of those. Um, and, and that also goes along with the fact that special needs students are not eligible for that because that's a whole separate program. It is strictly the kids that are um, just, be, just a little bit behind where they should be in, our, in their reading and math uh, standards. Okay, thanks. I was just asking because I know in first grade we have a lot of teachers talking about um, needed math support. Okay. Yeah, yeah um, we have we did have math support at Wilcox years ago, and it was funded slightly differently. Um, and right now, the only math support that we are using our title funding for is at seventh and eighth grade. Um, so it really depends on how much per people allocation is for each building and the amount of the salary we get. And so that kind of determines what we do at each building. But that's a very good question. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Potter, Mrs. Farthing. Um, I noticed there was a little dip on IDEA this year. Yeah, we haven't gotten to that one yet. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's the next one. No, you're fine. You're fine. I thought we were like wrapping it up. So I just no, didn't no. want to mess up. My you. part is done. I get to stop talking. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah, we're going to try to make sure we didn't miss it. Thanks. No. Did you say good that I'm done talking or good that my part's over? <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mrs. Honeycutt, uh, it's all yours. Thank you, Kylie. Good evening, everyone. I'm. Thank you. Okay, so now we will talk about IDEA B funding as well as early childhood and the parent mentor special education grant. So the IDEA Part B funding um, is uh, provide services for our students with disabilities. And we primarily use the funds to support teacher salaries and benefits as well as our support services, specifically our school psychologists and our occupational therapist that is in the district as well as um, some administrative salaries and benefits. And so Mrs. Gordon, yes, you see that this from fiscal year 17, uh, from fiscal year 18 through current year uh, for 21, there has been a dip from 20 to 21. Allocation for this um, 
funding is specifically connected to the number of students that we serve with disabilities and their eligibility categories. So it's strictly based on um, enrollment, identification, and the actual category that they are eligible for services. So that's why you see a, a reflection and a dip in the changes throughout the school years. So in reference to the early childhood funds, um, that is provides services for students with disabilities, but who are preschoolers, who have been identified through the early identification process between ages three and five. And we use the funding that is allocated there towards instructional assistance salaries for two of our preschool classrooms. And then we also, um, have continued to be eligible and have received the parent mentor grant. Uh, we first received it in our in the 2000 school in the ninth the 2000 school year. I'm sorry, it is a competitive grant. There are only 65 other school districts or 65 grants in general that are awarded. And ever since it started, we have been a recipient of that grant, which is approximately twenty five thousand dollars, and we use it to support one full time parent mentor in the district. I will open it up for questions. Okay. Hearing none, Mrs. Farthing. And I'd just like to add one little thing about the parent mentor grant this year. This year, we also received a supplemental um, $2,000 grant for the parent mentor program. And um, Mrs. Eisenhuth bought all kinds of fantastic things for some of our different classrooms. She was, it was like Christmas, really. Um, she was so excited. The teachers were so excited. It was like kids in a, at Christmas, really. Um, just so excited the things that she was able, and she was so thoughtful about what she purchased with that money, you know, watching every penny. And I, it was just very exciting to see that and how excited she was to be able to provide that. And it was just a one-time one time, $2,000 grant, but I think we'll, we've used every penny of it. And I, yes, it we great. did. And it was a competitive grant as well. It was a parent yeah. mentor mini grant, and we did have to apply, and um, it was competitive. And we were excited to learn that we had awarded it. And absolutely, the children have been very excited. But I think Mrs. Eisenhuth and our special ed education teachers were even more excited. I think so, yes. too. <laughs> um, does anyone have any other um, federal grant questions for us this evening? And I did want to note that the um, we specifically put at the bottom that the allocations were as of April 2021 because, as Mr. Potter said, they change all the time. You'll go in and you'll say, oh, look, it decreased or increased. Um, and so we just wanted to make sure, just in case there was ever a question, that we had that on there, that that was as of that point in time. Okay. And then the next item on the agenda is um, an academy update, just because we've had some exciting things happening and um, I'm not gonna steal Mr. Potter's thunder and just let him give a brief update as to what's been happening with the academy. Uh, the brief update, I still have a half hour, Mrs. Farthing, so I might just take all of that. I'm kidding, I will and not do that to anybody. I know, you might have mutiny on your hands. Yes, I, I will not do that. So a few updates. Uh, one of the things that we have talked about since this pandemic started is to make sure that the academy continues to uh, help students try to find their path after high school and also leading through their time at high school. And so I look back at where we were at at this time last year, and in year one, and I'll go back each year, year one, the, the amount of events that we had at this time, we had 27 events that were offered up to this point uh, in year one. In year two, the exact same number was offered, which was 27. Year three, obviously, we were cut a little short. We only had 14 events, and I can describe those events here in a little bit. But this year, because of our change into a virtual realm, we have offered 56 events so far this year. Um, which is, uh, I, I, our partners are amazing. And by the end of this month, uh, we'll have 66 events and we have a few more that I'll talk about here in a little bit. And the events themselves have been really some top notch, incredible offerings. Uh, I sat in on a leadership group the other day that I, I sat and listened for an hour and could have listened for at least two more. The speakers were amazing. The kids were engaged. It was a very good um, example of what we're trying to do. 
So for those that are interested, some of the events that we have open to the public that are coming up um, on the 14th, which is just a couple days away, we have our final part of our series that Ison will be there, I, I'm sure, of our startup series. We have Carol Miller, who's from American Greetings, will be talking about how to use the entrepreneurial mindset in a corporate setting. And this is part seven of our entrepreneur series that was designed by one of our other partners, Kristen Nervo. And so our students have been logging in once every couple of weeks to learn about how to be an entrepreneur. And uh, basically from the beginning where you get the idea to the funding, to marketing, everything you can think of. It really has been a great experience and very personalized to each one of the students that are in that. Uh, on the 15th, we have a student that, our student, we have a speaker that will be talking about being the first generation college student in a family and how that um, changed how she went about the approach to college and also what she wished her parents would have known getting to college. Uh, she is currently working at the University of Michigan. We won't hold that against her uh, as a housing person there. So she'll be talking about how she went from no college at all to now working at a college level. Next, um, April 19th, we'll be working with some of our alumni. We're doing some mentoring training, trying to get them ready for next year. Hopefully we'll have some uh, a deeper mentoring program than what we have right now. We're doing a little bit of a pilot with a couple kids and a, a mentor. Uh, but we have 18 alumni that are on the call next Monday to hear more about how they might be a mentor in the future. We have on the 20th, a uh, career in HR, which is um, a person that's part of the HR department at Steris up in Lake County. Then on the 21st, I'm really mm -hmm. excited this one, we have one of our Twinsburg alumnus, uh, Dr. William Komar, who graduated from Twinsburg, went to Louisiana State, flunked out, because of his uh, grades in science, came back to Akron, went back and got his degree, got his doctorate, and now he's a chemistry professor at the Arizona State University and has a series on YouTube you can all watch about teaching chemistry to high school kids. It's really, really good. And if you ever seen this guy smile, it is contagious. So he's definitely something and someone I'd want to listen to if I were you. And the last talk of this month, we have Trent Fosnott, who is a TV personality, but also is going to be talking about uh, the trades. He's a construction uh, manager, but also buys the old rundown houses in Charleston, South Carolina, and takes the worst of the worst and then resells them. He was part of American Rehab Charleston edition. So he'll be on on the 28th, and you can register uh, for any of those on our website. Uh, also, we have going right now, we have four different corporate challenges where partners have offered challenges to our teachers and our students, and they are now working through that to try to come up with a product. Um, we have a meeting with one of our partners and uh, Mike Bell's psychology classes on Thursday. They'll be talking about how they're going to help Ra, which is redeeming Africa's hope. They work in the slums of Nairobi, Kenya, and they're going to see what they can do to help provide um, some programming for the people that actually go over to Kenya and help the um, people of the slums of that one area that they are specifically working in. Um, and there's some questionnaires that they want the kids to design and or programming to help people understand the psychology behind the choices they make. We have a social justice art challenge that a, a artist from North Carolina, uh, Sally Jacobs, will be uh, leading in the challenges to pick a, a social justice cause, do the research on it, and create art that will draw attention to the cause. Sally did that with the migrant farm workers in North Carolina, and uh, she created this mural artwork piece on a bus that was absolutely phenomenal, and she's going to use that idea to help our students develop this art and hopefully at some point they're deciding how they're going to display that either virtually or in person if if we can work out maybe an outside show of some sort. We have a, a mock natural disaster put on by the CERT team, UH uh, hospitals and also our fire department. That one's um, basically we're going to be hit with a mock natural disaster and do a tabletop exercise with the students. So they have to think on their feet and react to the disaster. And we have a massive one for a Title IX event next year is the 50th anniversary of title nine which is the equality and it was initially designed for women's sports but just now it's equality in in all public features um not just women's sports and men's sports so 
it turned it started out as a fashion show and now it's a two-day event that will take place sometime in the summer of 2022 because we need time to plan and our partner is jeff orloff who was the person that oversaw uh a fashion week in new york city for many years and actually made it a profit um bearing uh event so he's going to bring his expertise to us and he's helping our kids and some college kids that also have volunteered their time to help us get this show off the ground. And Donna Houston, who's on this call, her kids will be part of that. Uh, it's, you know, thinking of marketing and setting up the stages and all the other things. Uh, Mr. Orloff has some big plans for us. We just have to make sure that we can do it. He's already mentioned Serena Williams and Nike and a few other people that I've just go, I wasn't quite ready for that. So that's a fun one. Um, we do have some student journalists that are now taking part and you can see them on your slide there. We have Ison, who is also on this call. Um, we have Lizzie Heiner, who's the girl in the middle. She's going to BYU next year. And this is her first attempt at the Academy in any way. And she told me several times now, she wished she would have started earlier because she really missed out on a lot of opportunities. And then that is not a really short high schooler. That's a sixth grader that is also involved. She came to one of our talks, Jennifer Hansler, who works at CNN and also a Twinsburg grad. And so was, it was so inspired. She wanted to be involved with the Academy. So we are we made her one of our journalists that puts out a weekly update and also a monthly update uh, for different audiences. And that's her speaking at the board meeting just the other night. Very dynamic, great little kid, um, does great work for us. So we have, along with these events that we have that I just mentioned, we also have some pilots that we're, we're setting up with. We have a pilot in uh, our startup. I won't say a pilot. I'm sorry. We have a leadership pilot that we're trying um, with some football players and, and Coach Bell and Marion Wright's leading that. And that's where we had our panel the other night that was absolutely spectacular. <clears throat> we had Dr. William Comar as part of that, but also Will Waller, who is the CEO of the National Wheelchair Basketball Association that was um, shot when he was 18 while, while selling drugs. And now he has turned his life totally around. And he is now a, um, a member, of our, I'm sorry, the CEO of the National Wheelchair Basketball Association, but also a two-time bronze medalist in uh, basketball in the Paralympics. And obviously has a great message about, you know, being in the wrong place at the wrong time and getting in the wrong situation. And he is paralyzed because of that violence that he suffered in Chicago. Um, but now he's obviously telling a very different story and what, what an inspiration. And another person on that panel was somebody that's a leader in, does leadership training for a GM car parts place up in Michigan. So we had a quite a range there. We did a medical series with Case Western Reserve University. We had an IT series with the University of Akron, and we're working on that leadership academy that we already talked about. And then we also have um, that mentoring program that we're working on. So we have a lot going on in the academy, and there are some other discussions about you know the future of the academy. And Dr. Hebert has uh, prepared for for the graduates. Ison and a few others to provide a stole for our seniors that are graduating this year. It's a very cool looking stole. Um, I still haven't actually worn any of them yet or seen them in person, but I saw it via the Zoom calls and what a great job there. And we're still looking at ways to make sure they're being recognized on their report card and or their transcripts uh, just to make sure that people know that they've done beyond the normal school uh, activities. I want to say that Ison has well, probably close to 200 hours of time outside of the school day learning about his career. And with all the choices that he's um, been exposed to, he has decided to go on to Cincinnati and uh, study IT. So I think we're getting um, this program refined a little bit more each, each year. We still spend very little, if any, money on the actual program of this, and obviously that's a huge benefit. And it all be, it's all because of the work of our partners to be able to offer all these opportunities for our kids. It's truly amazing what they've come up with. Wasn't a half hour, but it was darn close. It felt like it at least. Any questions on the Academy? Um, I just have one question. Uh, I've actually had a couple parents um, based on last board meeting reach out with a in new interest because mm -hmm. you're talking about it. Um, where's the best place you would recommend for people to go look to, uh, to do research? Yes, if they if they go to our homepage and go to the high school website, 
on the far uh, left side in the navigation column, you'll see the Academy at Twinsburg High School and all the links to the registrations and all the events are right there. It talks about what's coming up. Oh, and as we speak, look at Mrs. Farthing right on top of it. So this is the high school website. There's the Academy at Twinsburg on that far left side. And then here are the events coming up that I mentioned. Um, Ms. Farthing, could you scroll down even further to, so I can show the other pieces of this? Um, I'll just talk about them. So you can see the entire schedules right here. Uh, I'm taking them down when the month are completed. All the on the resources, you don't have to click on it. The resources are all the speakers that we've had because we do record all of the talks other than the pilot programs because we're just trying to refine those. But every talk that we've done so far is out there. We have close to 60 different videos out there that people can watch. We have the suggested courses that if you're interested in a specific pathway, what courses you should be taking. The teacher opportunities are the corporate curricular challenges and the videos that go with those. Um, pathway opportunities, we break it down by the pathways that we offer and the videos are there so they can see the videos by pathway. Uh, the volunteer opportunities are non-existent at this point just because we can't get kids out. And then a new feature was something that we put on there with the help of the, the high school guidance counselors to show how the different diplomas, SEALs, and the academy pathways all line up. It's, it's all there on a click. So send them to the high school webpage and then they'll be able to see it. Or they could contact me because I'm or Dr. Hebert and answer questions about the academy and what they can do to get involved. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Ison, any comments? No, not really. I think it's really a great program and I'm very excited to see what the future looks like for it. And Ison will be a mentor at some point. He doesn't know it yet, but he will be. And we also have um, Mrs. Booker. Her two sons are deeply involved in this and put in a ton of hours already. Uh, so there's another person on this call that has been part of the program for quite a while already. That's all I have, Mrs. Farthing. Thank you, Mr. Potter. Uh, Mrs. Powers, did you? Let's see if you if it'll work for you to talk. Sorry, everybody. I um, I had to step away because I had a call from Summit County Public Health. Of course, that takes precedence, right? So, um, and the reason for the call was they're still trying to iron out the details with regard to um, the rollout of the uh, vaccine for our students in um, ages 16, 17, and 18. So I didn't want to miss that call today and still looking forward for more information. But um, I appreciate your attention today. Uh, every time I see Ison, I tell him I'm, we're not signing his diploma because he can't go anywhere. And the same is true for Annie. Um, Annie and Ison um, are are just true role models at Twinsburg High School for anything positive. And uh, we, we are so um, pleased uh, for both of you. And I don't know if we have other students on the call this afternoon, but uh, in particular, Annie and, and Ison, uh, when I think of a picture of a graduate of Twinsburg High School that we can show everyone uh, this is what graduation from the high school should look like with the future that you both have. Uh, you you are both uh, the photos um, on, the, on that poster. So thank you for that. Um, we're just so delighted. The, the work of the staff behind the scenes to support the curriculum department and of course the curriculum department under Jen's leadership and, and Norm's assistance and Beth Mariola, who is our um, supervisor of innovative programs is really spectacular given all of the things that have happened this school year. And we just wanna thank you for your interest in uh, listening to some really great ideas and 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 actually providing your enthusiasm and your support of this work because it's really important for our staff to understand uh, the perspectives of our parents and of our students and so these meetings are are valuable to us and they inform us and they help uh, keep us on track so thanks for your time tonight and uh, we have one more meeting this year I guess it's in June and so I'm not sure if Annie and Ison are going to say see you um, at the end of May but if that is the case we sure look forward to hearing about all the exciting things that you'll be doing. And we thank you for your commitment to our school district and for your dedication to really great things happening all over our community. And, uh, we wish you the very best. Thank you, Mrs. Farley. Thank you, Mrs. Powers. And yes, we I don't really anticipate that you'll be with us June 7th. Um, right now, uh, our agenda item for June 7th at this moment is our uh, social justice courses, our, social justice titles um, and for June we're looking to approve the titles for first semester which are between the world and me 
All American Boys, Dear Martin, and The Bell Jar. And as a reminder, if anyone would like to read any of those, Mrs. Cash has uh, copies of them on her bookshelf. So if anyone wants to read them, just let us know. Um, and until then, uh, thank you so much again for your participation this evening. I have a look overtime lacrosse game I'm going to try to go get to the last minute or two of. And um, thank you very much. And um, we'll see you June 7th. Bye. <laughs>